Southwest Virginia. I was called to come uh, and talk about uh, coal and uh, inform the uh, uh, potential other uh, this uh, gentleman, I'll say younger gentleman, because he's a lot, older, a lot younger than I am, and we know that. As you get older, you know, if I confuse my words, so just read between the lines, okay? <laughs> now, what happened, uh, they were at air shop about 9 o'clock this morning, and most people are very, very misinformed about coal in Buckingham County. You know, a lot of people think that coal is black. Yes, it's black. And uh, most of uh, the average people, and I'm not doing that in saying it in a for manner, is it? black or I'm not uh, you know I gotta be careful what I say because today you know uh, you gotta say the right terms but you know Buckingham County we don't always say the right terms that these people on the national level like especially the far left but anyway uh, just a few things I think uh, uh, and not that I'm that knowledgeable it's just uh, I have to keep up with what's going on in the marketplace because at West River we have tried to stay up what's going on in the coal market, what's going on in the world market. And I tried to explain this morning why we all don't understand it, but I can get you a chart if, you, if you'd like a chart. But I, I, I went back to 2009 and 8 and, and tried to show the relationship to the price of coal, what happens in Buckingham County. Now a lot of people say, well, uh, coal's been killed. Well, coal, steam coal, has been killed by all the regulations by the Obama administration because you can't build a power plant in today's market because of the CO2. And under this new Trump uh, uh, um, executive orders, and, and uh, there'll be some things come out in the paper about that later. But anyway, it explains what the Obama administration did and what the Trump administration did to get coal back online. Now, coal really hasn't been killed in Buckingham. As this chart will show you, and most people don't realize that Roger and some of the other, some of the guys that keep up with the uh, budgets and so forth. What has happened? Uh, for example, can anybody tell me what the price of metallurgical coal is today? Today, uh, we can now. <laughs> it actually jumped to three hundred dollars a ton today. Now, why? Now, think about Buckingham County. We're a small county in southwest Virginia. What goes on in China and what goes on in Australia affects everything we do as taxpayers in Buckingham County. It could affect our budget by $15 million this year alone. And it's already starting to affect it. And I'm sure most of the uh, people that collect the money can tell you. Now what has happened in Buckingham County, air coal has been pretty much level except for 2011. And there was a reason it was 9 million tons but it's kind of state average at around 7 million tons. But what happens if you look at the price and you look at the floods in Australia in 2010 and 11, it was here. And then all of a sudden, everybody's back online producing metallurgical coal. So you come back to Economics 101. Uh, there's an oversupply of met coal, coking coal on the market. So price comes down to last year, it's $70 a ton. So we're getting paid on $200 a ton, which is 2% of coal and 3% of gas we got $32 million. As of the last year, it was around um, $10 million, somewhere in that area. But the price of coal averaged $70 a ton. Starting in August, uh, you had a disruption of coal supplies in China. And all of you know, in August, September, all of a sudden that line went this way. And I prepared uh, Mr. Stewart up for the chart. So it, it, you know, sometimes visual items can tell you better than I can stand in here. The picture's worth a thousand words sometimes. So I tried to be brief. And I'll try to get some of the people that need these charts to, to let you know. And it, it was, it's pretty simple. Because we keep up with all this data. All we had to do in an hour's time this morning, uh, Jessica Vanover put it in, and Jessica uh, Savage and Tina put it in a computer and punched out all this beautiful, or not beautiful <coughs> data, but data showing what happened. Now, starting in September, the disruption happened in China and the price jumped to $300 a ton. That doesn't mean everybody gets $300 a ton. What it means is on the average, a lot of them are on contract, but if they've got any extra tons, they're gonna fit on the spot market. Because everybody's gotta have coal, coal to make steel. Japan, China, United States. And all you market, all you, the price of metallurgical coal is determined on the Australian market. 
And this morning it did, uh, I was told it jumped $300 a ton. Now last week it was around 175 and everybody thought the week before, everybody thought this year was going to be around $167 a ton. Now do the math. Well, I'd rather be paid severance tax on $70 a ton or at $170 a ton. You do the math, that's over double uh, your money. But anyway, with the floods in Australia, it's now been flooded since of last week and week before last, and they're saying between 12 and 15 million tons of met coals will be taken off the market. All right, now, what's that done about coal prices in Buckingham County? Uh, 95% of all the coal produced in Buckingham County is metallurgical coal. So therefore, if you've got any additional supply of metallurgical coal, a lot of coal's on contract, three months, six months, a year. Big, big mine like Buckingham Minerals, probably on a year, but they're up in their production. They're probably going to do a million and a half to two million tons more than what they did two years ago. Instead of being 4.1 million tons, their production will probably get to six million tons. Do the math on that other two million tons that's not on contract. You can figure out how much severance tax will come back in account. But the only thing I try to do is explain real quick, and I'm going to sit down and uh, Jack's going to introduce uh, <coughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> school. Sorry, I get all squared away. Sometimes my tongue gets tied, tied up. But anyway, think about that. And let it roll around your head and do the math real quick in your head or get a calculator and figure what dollars that's going to make. I figure next year, the price stays at 175, and we get a lot of this extra production. We're going to end up 18 million dollars instead of 10 million this past year. So it could be 10 million dollars. Now think about that. What happens in Australia or China will affect Buckingham County as much as how much of the budget? 20, 25 percent, Roger. You get an extra 10 million dollars. Those seven. Well, that's how important the world market. Now, how do I predict what the cold's going to be? Do I know when a cyclone's going to hit Australia or the? Chinese cuts production, you don't know. So even the experts can't tell you that. But because of that disaster, it's going to benefit Buckingham County just like this. But anyway, Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much. You need to get one of those graphs he made for us. That was an eye opener. Uh, and I can't imagine having to try to work my budget around knowing whether there's going to be a cyclone in Australia. So, Roger, I don't know how you guys do it. But you figured it out. But uh, it was good information. Now, I want to talk a little bit of politics because I don't know about some of y'all, but I'm going to tell you where I was at a couple years ago. I was very involved in the Republican Party. Bobby May knows he and I run around all over Southwest Virginia. And I personally, I'm not speaking for anybody else, I personally got very <coughs> upset with folks in my party. I don't know where you guys are, what party you're in, but in my party, who we would elect and send to Richmond or D.C. or wherever, and they just would never do what they promised they'd do. They'd say something and they'd get up, they'd, they'd campaign like they were very conservative, and I'm extremely conservative, and they'd get up there and they wouldn't be. They'd be pretty, <coughs> pretty moderate. We can see that going on in D.C. right now. So I kind of got out of it. But along came this guy, Donald Trump, who turned me completely around and got me very excited again. And got That's right, Trump. <laughs> got me fired up and pulled me back into it. Uh, and And Bobby and Lynn, they know, I mean, I was all in. Even when a lot of people weren't with Trump before the, the nomination, I was all in. You know, Bob. You to Trump before it was cool. I was. I was the first statewide recognized chairman for Trump, or in, in the state for Trump. I was the first one to take a chairmanship in August of 15. Um, and then Corey quickly came on as the state chair. So anyway... That's what got me back in. But I thought I was going to be done then. And then on November the 8th, about 8.30 in the morning, Corey Stewart called me and said, hey, we won. Now are you ready to talk about 2017? And I spent almost a year running around the state with this guy. And what made him different than the rest of them is he came to southwest Virginia over and over and over. And you know what he did? Unlike so many politicians who come down and make a presentation, give a speech, and jump on the plane, they run to Abingdon, get on the airplane, go somewhere, they drive somewhere. No, <clears throat> he'd spend three or four days at a time and go knock on doors in southwest Virginia with me and Lynn and my wife and some of the other folks. I'd never seen a statewide candidate do that, and the guy's real. So he convinced me to get back in because he's the most conservative candidate I've seen in forever, and he's got some really great ideas. His tax plan is unbelievable compared to everybody else in the race. His 
his stance on illegal immigration. He's going to tell you about it. Nobody's ever done what he's already done on illegal immigration. Uh, just so many things that got me fired up. <clears throat> That's what we need. We talked about draining the swamp in Rich in D.C. We got to drain the swamp swamp in Richmond. It's closer and it smells worse. That's what somebody, <laughs> one of our guys said. Richmond, it, it's bad. So, just sending another politician up there ain't going to work. We got to send a real serious. Well, I'm looking for something. Same thing I was looking for in Trump. I was looking for a fighter. When everybody else was, I had to fight half of my party when I was supporting Trump early on. Heck, I lost some good friends over it even. But I'm looking for a fighter, not just a politician. And I'm looking for a winner. And Corey Stewart is a fighter like nobody I've ever seen. He's, I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit about his fight for our Virginia heritage. Another issue, nobody is willing to stand up and fight the people that are trying to take our heritage. I was in the middle of about 100 screaming liberal lunatics watching this guy fight them and stare them down. So the reason I'm back involved is I want to put a fighter in Richmond, and Corey Stewart is that fighter. Come on up, Corey. Right. Tell them about it. Thanks, Lee. <clears throat> Thanks, Jack. Yeah. Well, uh, first I want to I want to thank uh, Lynn. Where, Lynn, where are you, Lynn? I'm right here. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thanks for everything, putting the, this weekend together. <laughs> and Jack. Um, and uh, uh, and I also, you know, this morning we had a chance to, to uh, uh, see the facility and learn a whole lot about um, Met Coal and I learned a lot of new terms too, I gotta say, from Joe and I just want to thank Joe, Joe put, put this, uh, this lunch together and I want to thank you for, for lunch and thank you for gener your generosity and, and allowing us to, uh, to come together uh, today. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I want to let you know more than any other candidate out there, I realize that Virginia does not end at Roanoke. That's right. We've spent so much time here. We've spent so much time down here, uh, first for the Trump campaign, and then, uh, and then and for my campaign. I don't know how many times we've been down here, but uh, and I'll, typically I'll come down here for you know three or four days at least because it is uh, quite a haul. And, uh, but I've always enjoyed it, and I love coming down to Southwest, and people are so kind. And, and here's the thing. Southwest Virginia can again, it's, its economy, it can again be the engine of economic growth, not just for this area, but for the entire state. And that is exactly what we're going to do over the next four years. So it's easy to say that, it's easy to say that, but this is what we're going to do about it, and we're going to do about it, we're going to do it together. The first thing is, we're going to put a governor's office right here in Southwest Virginia, right here. If we're going to focus in, if sometimes if things are out of sight, they're out of mind. You've got to put an office right here. There's going to be a governor's office right here in Southwest, and we're going to do you, three... When you say Southwest, are you talking about Cannon, or are you talking about Cannon? <laughs> You know what I had to do is I had to promise it in every county that I go to. <laughs> you know, I, I'm just asking. <laughs> but uh, we're not sure yet. We're, we're going to figure that out. Okay. But a uh, Buchanan would be a great possibility. Yeah, because, I mean, this is, you know, the, the coal industry and everything else is, is really kind of the uh, grand central station for that. So uh, three things we've got to do. The very first thing is you've got to have adequate infrastructure, you have to have adequate access to this part of the state. Uh, and the only way we're going to get that done, and we can utilize coal engineering, coal technology, and we can build out at a much lesser cost than we, if it was someplace else in the state, we've got to build the Coalfields Expressway. Absolutely. That's got to be done. Um, second is, some of you may know that our horrible uh, current governor, uh, Governor McAuliffe, would not renew uh, the coal tax credit. And I want to let you know that one of the first things that I'm going to do as governor is restore the coal tax credit here. It is just common sense. We're going to get that done. And finally, third, and this is per perhaps the most important thing that we can do, is probably going to be the hardest thing to do. But I've already done it. And those of you, including, including Joe and others who have been on the Board of Supervisors uh, or a school board, you know how tough it is to, to handle a budget. And at a local level, 
There's only one way to reduce taxes. You have to reduce spending. You have to reduce spending. There's a big difference here. Now, both my opponent and I are both proposing uh, an income tax cut in Virginia. His, however, is completely, he's not proposing to cut a single nickel from the Virginia budget. His is all dependent upon unanticipated extra revenues at the state level. Well, folks, that hasn't happened in 10 years. You can't just depend upon increased revenues for the state when there hasn't been a record of that happening. So what we had to do in Prince William County, we had our values, uh, by the way, I'm countywide elected in Prince William, in, you know, in the three big counties up north, uh, Fairfax, Loudoun, and Prince William County have a countywide directly elected as the chairman. It's a bit like being a, a big city mayor, and I've done that for 10 years now, four elections, one special election, and then I was reelected uh, three times, the latest time in 2015. And it's a tough district. It's 454,000 people. I'm dire directly elected by everybody in the county. And it's a 60-40 Obama district. It's very, very tough. It's 54% minorities. But I've been able to win it. And the reason I can win it is because I've worked hard. I have work hard whether it's an election year or not election year. I go to all the churches. I do all that. And we've produced results that even Democrats can appreciate. We've reduced their taxes, we've improved services, and we've cut down on crime. The way we had to cut down on our tax bills, we had to cut spending. We had our, our property values decrease by 60% on the residential side, 60% in two years. This is as soon as I got into office. In fact, all the liberals blame me for the, the crash in property values, which was, of course, ridiculous. But they dropped by 60%. We could have just equalized our revenues by jacking the rate way, way up, but it would have resulted in Prince William County having rates that were far too high, the highest in the state, and they, uh, we would have taxed, because we have to tax commercial properties at the same uh, rate as residential, it would have been a big burden, uh, too big of a burden, frankly, on business. So we had to cut $185 million out of our budget in one year. And we did it. We did it. And we held every account, every department accountable, and we forced them to do this. We said, look, if your budget had to be cut at 10, 20, and 30 percent, what would you cut? And they have to be real cuts, not just these fake things. Not, and if we come back and we say we're going to cut this, it better be a real cut because otherwise your job is on the line. We held every department head uh, responsible, and those decisions, those, those uh, uh, expenditure, the savings that was pushed down deep within the bureaucracy so everybody was looking for spending cuts. And because of that, we were able to reduce the average tax bill in Prince William County in a single year by over $400. It was a record for the county. We are currently, all these years later, the average tax bill when I uh, came to came to office in Prince William County was $4,141. And all these years later, 10 years later, after adding hundreds of new firefighters, hundreds of new police officers, and the most aggressive road building program in Virginia, our tax bills today are $4,038. They're less than they were 10 years ago. That is what we've got to do in Virginia. Other people talk about tax cuts. I know how to do it. I know how to cut spending. And that is why, what we're gonna do in the first year of my governorship, we're going to reduce the average tax bills, uh, the, uh, sorry, we're gonna reduce the tax rate in Virginia, which is currently at 5.75%, down to 4.75%. We've, we've gotta cut every department, on average, about 10%. But remember, remember, that when we know as conservatives that when you reduce spending on the government side and you reduce taxes, the private sector flourishes. So a lot of this will be made up by increased revenue and increased growth in the state as a whole as we move forward. That is the first part of what, how we're going to uh, revive the economy, not just in Southwest, but throughout the state. But there's gonna be a focus here. And one of the things we're looking at is a special income tax reduction or elimination in those border counties, those counties that are bordering states with lower 
uh, 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 income taxes, especially in Tennessee. Now imagine if you're in Lee, Scott, Washington counties or the city of Bristol. You neighbor, and in the case of Bristol, literally, the line goes right through the town, a state that has zero income tax. So how on earth are you supposed to draw businesses onto your side of the line when they, have, they can go right to the other side into Tennessee and they can't and pay no income tax? We've got to look at that, and we're going to look at that for uh, South Side and Southwest Virginia. That's not the only thing that's facing Virginia, though. There is a drug epidemic that is growing in this state. The sheriff knows it. You all know it. All, all of you involved. We have a heroin epidemic. And opiates are just destroying communities in Virginia and throughout the country for that matter. 80% of heroin is smuggled in through our southern border, mostly by illegal aliens. Mostly by illegal aliens. When we address this topic of illegal immigration, <coughs> it fixes so many other problems. Crime is a big one. You know, and one of the reasons we cracked down on illegal immigration in my county was because of MS-13 killing, really horrible killings. There are no kids in the room, so I'm going to tell you exactly what to do, but part of getting into this gang is to kill somebody. Just in Northern Virginia, just in the last few months, <coughs> thankfully not in my county, we've had some teenage girls who were murdered, mutilated, raped, murdered, and that was done by MS-13. And if you think it's only in Northern Virginia or Hampton Roads, you're wrong. Just last week, uh, 11th grade boy from Lynchburg, 17 years old, is abducted. They cut off his hands, they cut off his feet while he's still alive, and then they slice his throat, almost kept severing his head. And that happened in Bedford. Now think about that for a second. This is a problem that will not end unless we confront it. To do it, We've got to do what we did in Prince William County 10 years ago. The policy is really simple. We use the 287G authority. It allows us to work with the federal government. It allows the federal government to leverage local and state law enforcement agencies to do this. Once somebody is arrested for a crime, we're not going out, we're not you know, doing these raids, or we're not doing anything like that. Once somebody is arrested for a crime, doesn't matter what the crime is, we check 100% of everybody who's brought into our jail, everybody, whether you're white, you're black, Hispanic, or Asian, we check your immigration status. If you're here illegally and you've committed a crime, we begin the deportation process, the, the paperwork, and once you've served your sentence, out you go. We hand you over to the feds. Unfortunately, the Obama administration was releasing a lot of these guys. We knew it because we were rearresting about 17% of them, but under a a real president of the United States that we have in office right now, we know they're going to be removed, and that's an important public safety. Uh, it's, it's the most important job of every level of government is to protect the lives and the safety and the rights of all of us, of all of the citizens that we serve. So that's what we're going to do. It's going to cut down on opiates, it's going to come, cut down on heroin, and it's going to make us, it's going to root out illegal alien gangs, especially MS-13, and it's going to make us all more safe here in Virginia. Finally, I want to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, and we're going to do this. We're going to lay a wreath a little bit later on uh, this afternoon, and uh, and then we're going to uh, we are we're going to go to Hurley High School, where their mascot is the Rebel. And I think I'm the first politician, uh, at least on the gubernatorial level, who's probably visited Hurley High School in a long, long time. Anyway. And um, they fly the Confederate flag. And let me tell you something, I am not afraid of this issue. I'm not afraid of controversy. When we, so far in Prince William County, by the way, on the illegal immigration, we have handed over to the feds in 10 years more than 7,500 criminal illegal aliens and our violent crime rate dropped in three years by 48.7%, almost a 50% drop in violent crime simply by enforcing our immigration laws. Now. When you think about Virginia, I don't know what the rest of you, I actually I'm pretty confident I know about the rest of you, but when, when I go travel someplace and somebody asks me where I'm from, I say Virginia, and I'm, like, I'm proud of it. I'm really, really proud to be from Virginia. There's something special about this state. And what is it? It's our history. 
It's our heritage. Because we're the state of Washington, Jefferson, and Madison, but we're also the state of Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, Jeb Stewart, and we need to embrace that. We should not be afraid of it, and we've been afraid of it for too long, for 40 or 50 years, when the left pushes back and tries to make us embarrassed about our history and our heritage, we've been running. It's time to stop running, and it's time to embrace our heritage. Because you know something? Some people don't think this is as big of an issue as, say, taxes or transportation. It's everything. Because if you lose your heritage, especially here in Virginia, if we lose this heritage, we lose our identity. And it's under attack. Now, those left-wing lunatics who attacked us down in Charlottesville when we were trying to do a video to stop the removal of the statue, the Charlottesville City Council voted to remove a statue of Robert E. Lee that had been there since 1924. So Jack and I went there, we got absolutely mobbed by these crazies. But here's why it's so important. It's not just about that statue. The Charlottesville City Council said that when they're done with removing Robert E. Lee, they're coming after Thomas Jefferson. And it won't stop in Charlottesville. It'll spread like wildfire. It'll go from Charlottesville. It'll go, it'll go to Richmond. It'll go to Peter, Petersburg. It, it'll go up to Arlington and Alexandria. It's going to go all across this state. And pretty soon there will only be a few localities left with the symbols of our heritage and our history here in Virginia until it's all gone. So we have to stand up. And if we don't stand up now, we lose it forever. And that is why I'm proud to be going to Hurley High School later on tonight. The cheerleaders are going to be there and everything. It's going to be a great time. So, yeah, where is she? I'm wearing my Hurley Red Bull hat. All right. And I bought one myself. I'm ready. So anyway, folks, I'm going to keep it short, and I'll answer any questions you might have. But you know, in 2016, we all got together, and we took back the White House. And in 2017, we are taking back Virginia. Thanks a lot.